life on earth is a pilgrimage. A journey towards a destination. But before any traveler can set out for his destination, he must first of all know how to get to where he wants to go. We'll be able to carry the cross faithfully to the end of our lives. For us Catholics, heaven is a real destination and goal in life. Once you hear the word of Jesus and Mary, it is the alliance of the heart. In the Apostles' Creed, we have been given the road map that will guide us to heaven. A road map that is now well explained in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I am Father Bing Arolano. International Spiritual Director of the Alliance of the Holy Family International, a global family movement dedicated for the sanctification of the family, youth, clergy, and media, by consecration to the hearts of Jesus and Mary. and by living the grace-filled, sinless lifestyle of the communion of reparation. Welcome to the Alliance of the Holy Family International Primary Formation Course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now we come to a very important and currently also a very controversial issue in the Catholic Church, never before considered as such, as the institution of marriage has been highly respected and unchallenged until now. The social doctrine of the Church, as well as in Article 215 and 218 of the Compendium of the Catholic Church calls marriage is the foundation of family life. This document on the social doctrine of the Church clearly explains that the family has its foundation in the free choice of the spouses to unite themselves in marriage in respect for the meaning and values of this institution that does not depend on man but on God Himself, for the good of the spouses and their offsprings as well as of society, this sacred bond no longer depends on human decision alone. It adds that the family symbolizes the eschatological marriage between Christ, who is the bridegroom, and the mystical body of Christ, the Church, as the bride. And as Sister Lucia revealed it to the late Carlo Cardinal Caffara in 1981, who was then the president of the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family Life, that the family is the last battle of contention between God and Satan. In her words, Sister Lucia said, and I quote, The final battle between the Lord and the kingdom of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, however, because whoever works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought against and opposed in every way 
because this is the decisive issue. And Sister Lucia concluded with these words, and I quote, Nevertheless, Our Lady has already crushed his head, meaning Satan. This goes without saying that he who wins the family wins the society and the church. Why? Because the unit cell of the society and the church, according to John Paul II, is the family. In Article 48 of his 1981 Apostolic Exhortation, Familiaris Consortium, John Paul II wrote definitively that the family is the unit cell of the society. Quoting this great pontiff, he clearly said, Thus the family, which in God's plan is the basic cell of society and the subject of rights and duties before the state or any other community. The same pontiff also declared, that the family is also the foundation of the church, explaining that the Christian family is a church in miniature or ecclesia domestica, in such a way that in its own way, the family is a living image and historical representation of the mystery of the church. If then, the family is destroyed, the society and the church are destroyed as well, and Satan wins the final battle against God. If we look at the present state of global affairs, it would seem that Satan and his minions are winning and gaining much foothold in the family and the society at large. Although Our Lady of Fatima's message on the family, which Carlo Cardinal Cafara received from Sister Lucia in 1981, assures us of victory against Satan during the decisive battle in the end times. Yet, the deplorable lifestyle and scandals in the hierarchy that continue to rock the church seemingly belie this promise. Nevertheless, Benedict XVI on December 31, 2006, firmly insisted in his homily that the family comprising the father, mother, and child is modeled after the Holy Family of Nazareth, who is Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. And on June 11, 2006, in his talk with the different dicasteries in the Vatican, this Pope Emeritus clarified even more that ultimately, the perfect model of communication and perfect love in the family is the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To destroy, therefore, the family to divorce, separation, and adultery is to deform the permanent properties of marriage, that is, of indissolubility and unity between husband and wife, including the image of the Holy Family, as well as the permanent and eternal unity of the one and triune God. Again, in his Familiaris Consortium, John Paul II repeatedly expressed that at this moment in history, the family is the object of numerous forces who seek to destroy it or in some way to deform it. Some of the many subtle attacks against family and married life are the following. First, homosexual marriage and abortion. According to Carlo Cardinal Capara, these two destroys the two pillars of marriage, namely one, the properties of marriage, which is indissolubility and unity, and two, procreation, which is the essential end of marriage. Professor Roberto Mattei, an Italian Roman Catholic historian and author who delivered a talk on sexualization of society, 
the death of society, voice of the family, in Rome on May 18, 2018, reiterated Cardinal Cafar's statement, which said, and I quote, the negation of procreation by Marxist Russia turns Christian morals upside down using the first century heresy of Gnostic metaphysical principle, that is, sex as an ultimate end of man, close up to its own immanence. Second, the LGBTQ community, whose acronym stands for those sexual orientation it embraces, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgenders, queer, or questioning gender identity. This sexually deviant community destroys sacramental grace, which sanctifies marriage in its chaste conjugal love found in the marital act that welcomes always new life, the gift of God. On the other hand, homosexual relationship, when equated to marriage, is the destruction of the second pillar of the sacrament of marriage, that is, procreation. Homosexual relationship between the same sex is more for pleasure and denies the divine essential element of procreation between male and female by which God wills to procreate man for eternity. Third, satanical medieval sex. According to Professor Robert Matei, this group hate family life and advocate freedom from all moral prohibitions, essentially from the Ten Commandments. It proclaims that man is divinized by promiscuous sex. The Protestant Revolution reformist Anabaptist preaches antinomianism or the negation of all moral law, which is the Decalogue, using Gnosticism in the first century, that the spiritual man is not capable of sin even after the fall of Adam and Eve. Among the options of Anabaptist reform, according to Professor Matei, were the feminist sex that advocate for its fundamental rights, sexual promiscuity, nudism, and free love. Another disciple of Anabaptist is the reformist Sigmund Freud, known more as the pillar of experimental psychology. To him is attributed the destruction of family life, as well as religious and priestly vocations. He authored a book on pansexualism, which helped destroy conjugal chastity in marriage, as well as religious chastity and priestly celibacy. In his book, Sigmund Freud claimed that chastity and celibacy are repressive and made religious and priests rigid. To be humanly mature, according to Freud, married people, religious and priests, should live freely by being immoral, impure, and perverted. Then in 1789, the French revolutionist Marcus de Sade provided the theory of revolutionary pansexualism, which includes blasphemy against God, homicide, theft, as well as all types of sexual perversions, incest, rape, and sodomy, just to name a few. Vice is considered a virtue. Horror is beautiful. Torment is pleasurable. In this sense, Marcus de Sade's vision of the word is satanic. Professor Matei continued to explain that in 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin and Stalin legalized in all communist countries abortion, prostitutions, and homosexual acts, which bore the beginnings of the LGBTQ. 
Although the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or USSR, was destroyed through the consecration of John Paul II of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, its errors, which included atheism, military rule, and the culture of death, divorce, euthanasia, abortion, total birth control, homosexual union, have spread throughout the world through the United Nations. These errors continue to destroy the sanctity of marriage and family life today. What is the sacrament of matrimony or marriage in the plan of God? By definition, the sacrament of matrimony is defined by both Canon Law 1055 and Article 1601 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church as the matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of their whole life and by its nature ordered towards the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of the offspring. This covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. In general, a sacrament, as we have previously defined it, is an external sign instituted by Christ to confer grace. By this, the external sign of the sacrament of matrimony which refers to its matter and form are the following. The matter is a man and a woman with legal capacity, according to Canon 1073 to 1094. The form, on the other hand, is the couple's voluntary mutual consent expressed in their I do's, the married covenant as explained in Article 1626 to 1628 of the Catechism. There is also the primary and secondary ends of matrimony in God's mind, without which marriage is invalid. For the primary end, there is, first, procreation. This means that the couple willingly cooperates with God's plan in giving birth to future saints in heaven as mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 to 28, which says, Go and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Second, rearing of children. This means raising and educating their children as citizens of the mystical body of Christ. In other words, if the wife or husband would only want to have the pleasure of the sexual act and not desire to have any children, as it would only be a burden to both and thus uses artificial birth control. If this intention is proven correct beyond reasonable doubt, their marriage can be invalidated. For the secondary end, there is one mutual love, which in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 gives the explanation, and I quote, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Two, protection from concupiscence. This is clarified in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when it says, and I quote, Wherefore, a man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be two in one flesh. Now, deepening this definition of marriage between the spouses, there is a covenant or contract drawn between them before God, the result of which is a divine institution that no one can destroy, even the spouses themselves or by the civil or ecclesiastical law. Spiritually, this covenant is founded on Mark chapter 10, verse 9, which attests, and I quote, What God has joined together, let no man separate. 
It is therefore a mortal sin to divorce after contracting marriage. The contract exacts that the couple give themselves to one another in conjugal act. The contract, however, ceases at the death of a spouse. What does the praise between a man and a woman mean? Remember, marriage is for unity between one male and one female. To marry, the union between two females or between two males is violating God's institution of matrimony and therefore is a mortal sin. This is very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, which says, and I quote, Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor the homosexuals, nor liars shall possess the kingdom of God. Other praises in the definition and their explanation include the following. One, partnership of their whole life. This means that their covenant is indissoluble for life. Two, well-being of spouses. This is the essential end of marriage, in mutual love, serving one another. Three, procreation. Again, this is the primary essential end of marriage, to give birth to future citizens of heaven. 4. Upbringing of children. The first responsibility of parents is the Christian rearing of children. This entails the grave responsibility of understanding well the eight basic elements of the Catholic faith in the Apostles or Nicene Creed, broken into eight basic elements, systematized by the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Five, dignity of the sacrament of matrimony. The contract between spouses is raised to the level of sacrament by Jesus Christ. Therefore, in God's plan, marriage is established by the Creator and endowed by Him with its proper laws with God Himself as the author of marriage. Article 1603 of the Catechism says that marriage is not only a human institution, even amidst many variations in culture and social structures it had undergone through centuries. These variations should not forget that there is a common and permanent characteristics inherent to it. Article 1604 of the Catechism further adds that God, who created man out of love, also calls him to love. The fundamental and innate vocation of every human being, since God created him, man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves men. Now married couples begin to realize mainly by experience that their marriage is as fragile as how they allow the following challenges to destroy it. And what are these challenges? There are six main ones 
not necessarily in the following order of importance. One, disorder. Two, domination. Three, infidelity. Four, jealousy. Five, conflicts. And six, separation. However, faith teaches us that the disorderly life of couples does not stem from the nature of man and woman, nor from the nature of their relationships, but essentially from sin. Article 1607 of the Catechism points to the original sin as the first consequence in the rupture of the original communion between man and woman. The relationship between married couples were distorted by mutual recrimination or criticism. And God's gift of mutual attraction turned into relations of domination and lust. The beautiful vocation of man and woman to be fruitful, to multiply, and to subdue the earth, as Article 1607 explains, has become burdened by the pain of childbirth and the toil of work. In the Old Testament, the indissolubility and unity of marriage are already developed, although polygamy was still tolerated only because, as Jesus told the Pharisees, of the hardness of heart of the Israelites, that Moses tolerated the men to divorce their wives. But in the New Testament, Jesus placed marriage in its original dignity and beauty, in its essential property of unity and indissolubility. Jesus condemned divorce and remarried, branding it adultery, which nullifies either one of the spouses from entering the kingdom of heaven. Mark chapter 10, verses 2 to 12, clearly states this, and I quote, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another is committing adultery with him. It is by following Christ, renouncing themselves, and taking up their crosses that spouses will be able to receive the original meaning of marriage and live it with the help of Christ. This grace of Christian marriage, according to Article 1615 of the Catechism, is the fruit of Christ's cross, the source of all Christian life. Marriage here on earth symbolizes the heavenly marriage of Christ with the church, as mentioned in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 3, in this scatological reality. Ephesians chapter 5, Verses 22 to 25 says, and I quote, As Christ loves the church and remains faithful with the church, so likewise husband must be faithful to their wives, so that matrimony becomes a sign to the heavenly wedding between Christ and the church. Conjugal chastity must be maintained. That is, each of the couple should apply the conjugal act only to their legitimate spouse in mind and heart and not with another. Article 1617 of the Catechism therefore teaches, and I quote, Christian marriage in its turn becomes an efficacious sign, the sacrament of the covenant of Christ and the church. Since it signifies and communicates grace, Marriage between baptized person is a true sacrament of the new covenant. Christ likewise established virginity for the sake of the kingdom to foreshadow the eschatological union between Christ and the church. 
In Matthew chapter 19, verse 12, we read the following, and I quote, For there are eunuchs who had been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who had been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves like eunuchs by being continent for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. The Council of Nicaea in 325 AD interprets the scriptural praise like eunuchs as men and women who live in voluntary continence, meaning abstinence from the gratification of merits. Continence is part of the cardinal virtue of temperance, wherein by continence, men and women, by the grace of God, imitate Jesus' continence for the sake of the kingdom, so that they can directly wed the Lamb, who is Jesus, in heaven, who is the real bridegroom of the church. Virginity then, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, is an unfolding of baptismal grace, a powerful sign of the supremacy of the bond with Christ. As we read in Mark chapter 12, verse 25, and of the ardent expectation of Christ's second coming, a sign which also recalls that marriage is a reality of this present age which is passing away. Revelations 14, verse 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31 also explain that from the very beginning of the church, there had been men and women who have renounced the great good of marriage to follow the Lamb wherever He goes, to be intent on the things of the Lord, to seek to please Him, and to go out to meet the bridegroom who is coming. Both the virginity and the sacrament of matrimony for the kingdom of God come from the Lord Himself. As Article 1619 to 1620 of the Catechism explains it, whoever denigrates marriage by adulterous relationship also diminishes the glory of virginity. Whoever praises it by conjugal chastity makes virginity more admirable and resplendent. How then is the celebration of marriage done? Originally, in the Latin rite, matrimony takes place during the celebration of the Holy Mass to express the connection of all sacraments to the Paschal mystery of Christ, the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, the memorial of the new and everlasting covenant is realized in which Christ, who is the bridegroom, weds the bride, the church, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21 verse 2 clearly says, and I quote, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Article 1621 of the Catechism explains this further in the following. It is therefore fitting that the spouses should seal their consent to give themselves to each other to the offering of their own lives by uniting it to the offering of Christ for His Church made present in the Eucharistic sacrifice and by receiving the Eucharist so that communicating in the same body and in the same blood of Christ, they may form but one body in Christ. Since matrimony is a sacrament, to sanctify the couple, it is also required that both go to confession before the wedding takes place so that they could receive the Eucharist worthily as Article 1623 of the Catechism also explains. Thereafter, the couple should continue frequenting 
the sacraments of confession and the Eucharist. For the strength they need to combat the temptation of the flesh and infidelity, which had become the number one cause of divorce, especially in Europe. Article 1623 continues to explain that in the Latin rite, the minister of the sacrament of matrimony are the spouses themselves. However, for validity of the sacrament, the couple's mutual consent should be expressed before the church, before the priest or bishop or their delegate, the deacon who gives them the blessing. The various liturgies abound in prayers of blessing and epiclesis or invocation, asking for God's grace and blessing on the new couple, especially the bride, during the wedding ceremony. Article 1624 of the Catechism adds that in the epiclesis of the sacrament of matrimony, the spouses receive the Holy Spirit as the communion of love of Christ and the Church. The Holy Spirit is the seal of their covenant, the ever available source of their love and the strength to renew their fidelity. Now let's go into the matrimonial consent. How is this done? Take note that it is the exchange of consent that makes or validates the marriage between a man and a woman with legal capacity according to canonical form. Remember too that the parties to a marriage covenant must be a baptized man and woman who are free to contract marriage and who freely express their consent. The praise to be free means two things. One, each one of the parties is not under any constraint or restriction. Two, both are not impeded by any natural or ecclesiastical law as explained in Article 1625 of the Catechism. When is the consent considered lacking, in which case there is no marriage, according to Article 1626 of the Catechism? The following conditions must be in place for the consent to be acceptable and the sacrament of matrimony valid. 1. The consent, by definition, consists in a human act by which the partners mutually gave themselves to each other. Therefore, the statement, I take you to be my wife and I take you to be my husband are essential as this consent finds its fulfillment in the two becoming one flesh. This is clearly stated in Article 1627 of the Catechism. Two, the consent must be an act of the will of each of the contracting parties, free of coercion and grave external fear. Article 16.2.8 adds that no human power can substitute for this consent. If this freedom is lacking, the marriage is invalid. 3. The priest or deacon receives the consent of the spouses in the name of the church and gives the blessing of the church, as mentioned in Article 1629. Without the priest, the sacrament of matrimony is invalid. 4. The presence of at least two witnesses are necessary for validity. This is because marriage is a state of life of the church, and therefore, the public character of the consent protects the I do.
What then are the effects of the sacrament of matrimony? When the sacrament of matrimony is validly celebrated, it will have the following effects. One, matrimony establishes a perpetual and exclusive bond between the spouses. Two, God himself seals the consent of the spouses. Three, after receiving God's seal, the marriage which is ratified and consummated between baptized person can never be dissolved. Four, matrimony bestows upon husband and wife the grace necessary to strengthen them to attain holiness in their married life by accepting their daily crosses and following Christ. Five, the sacrament of matrimony gives each spouse equal obligation and rights to whatsoever pertains to the partnership of conjugal life, meaning their children, properties, money, and the like, as is stated in Article 1135 of the Catechism. Six, matrimony obliges the couple to accept the grave responsibility which is the gift of children and providing for their Christian education. This includes the children's physical, social, cultural, moral, and above all, religious upbringing as explained in Canon 1136 and Article 346 of the Compendium. 7. Children conceived and born of valid or of putative marriage are considered legitimate as explained in Canon 1137. Putative marriage happens when the sacrament of marriage is invalidly contracted due to some deriment impediments, but still is celebrated in good faith by at least one member. A deriment impediment in the canon law of the Catholic Church is a legal obstacle that prevents the sacrament of marriage from being performed validly or licitly. Simply, these legal obstacles are conditions or circumstances that invalidate a marriage. For instance, the existence of a prior marriage. Now, until there is positive ecclesiastical proof of nullity, a putative marriage has all the effects of a lawful wedlock. Children born from this kind of marriage are legitimate. Note that illegitimate children are legitimized by a putative marriage. An example is this. A Protestant father thought, assume, or alleged in good faith to have contracted in the Catholic Church a valid marriage with a Catholic spouse. He had a child with a Catholic spouse from that anomalous contract even before the divorce from a previous spouse was finally annulled. Illegitimate children of such anomalous contract are legitimized by the putative merits. Let's discuss now the goods and requirements of conjugal love, which is a critical issue. By its nature, the love between spouses bear two characteristics. One, unity, and two, indissolubility. We briefly mentioned at the beginning of this episode that these two are the essential properties of marriage. Now, unity means one man and one woman becomes one flesh. Contrary to this unity in marriage is what we call bigamy, having two wives, and polygamy, having three or more wives, or having two husbands, which is called Bayeandri, or polyandry, 
having three or more husbands. Ephesians 5.31 has this to say on unity of marriage, and I quote, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be two in one flesh. In the end times, this fidelity of conjugal love as a unity signifies the unity of the disposal of Christ with the church. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 and Revelations 21 verse 21 express it with clarity in the following words. A husband should love his wife as much as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Ephesians 5.25 And I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem descending from heaven from beside God prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Revelations 21.21 21. In the document, Gaudium Espes, number 48, verse 1, it says, and I quote, The unity of marriage, distinctly recognized by our Lord, is made clear in the equal personal dignity which must be accorded to man and wife in mutual and unreserved affection. In Article Number 83 of John Paul II's 1981 Apostolic Exhortation, Familiaris Consortio, this great pontiff wrote, the intimate union of marriage as a mutual giving of two persons and the good of the children demand total fidelity from the spouses and require an unbreakable union between them. The second character of marriage is indissolubility. This indissoluble character of matrimony is by divine institution and cannot be undermined by any human or ecclesiastical law, for it has its basis in Scripture. We read in Mark chapter 10, verse 9, the following, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, contrary to indissolubility, is divorce. As Catholics, we understand, however, that no civil law can legalize what God has finalized for eternity. This is carved on stone in Mark chapter 10, verse 11 to 12, which says, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This is even made clearer in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, which says, and I quote, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals will ever enter the kingdom of heaven. Now we shall explain the essential ends of marriage. First, let's take procreation. This means that married couples must have the openness to fertility. Article 1652 of the Catechism teaches that husband and wife should be open to love and life. 
and not use artificial birth control, which are contraceptives. The couple should not only resort to abortive fashions, but never to contract abortion, which is murder. Article 1652 clearly says that by its very nature, the institution of marriage and married love is ordered to the procreation and education of the offspring. And it is in them that it finds its crowning glory. The article continues that children are the supreme gift of marriage and contribute greatly to the good of the parents themselves. Hence, through married love and the whole structure of family life which results from it, without diminishment of the other ends of marriage, are directed to disposing the spouses to cooperate valiantly with the love of the Creator and Savior, who through them will increase and enrich their family from day to day. Canon 1398 also directs that a person or persons who participated in abortion are automatically excommunicated because this is killing a human being with a soul at the moment of conception or the fertilization of the sperm and ovum of the father and mother. Canon 1398 specifically says, and I quote, a person who actually procures an abortion incurs a latis intentia, meaning automatic excommunication. In addition, the fruitfulness of conjugal love covers all aspects in the life of the child, from biological, spiritual, moral, and supernatural life. This makes the parents responsible for the education of their children in making them citizens of the kingdom of God. Parents should therefore know very well their Catholic faith and must have a firm grasp of the eight basic elements of Catholic faith contained in the Catechism to be able to perform this grave responsibility of bringing their children to heaven. Article 1653 of the Catechism says, and I quote, the fruitfulness of conjugal love extends to the fruits of the moral, spiritual, and supernatural life that parents hand on to their children by education. Parents are the principal and first educators of their children. In this sense, the fundamental task of marriage and family is to be at the service of life. There are also three canonical requirements for a valid matrimony for Catholics. First, legal capacity. Second, integral consent. And third, canonical form. First, legal capacity, which is explained in depth in Canons 1073 to Canon 1094. To be validly married, therefore, the legal requirements are the following. One, in terms of age, the female must at least be 14 years old and the male 16 years old. This is clearly stipulated in Canon 1083, paragraph 1. Two, there is no problem in terms of importance. This means there is no antecedent and permanent impotency which makes either of the spouses unable to perform the essential ends of marriage, which is procreation. 3. There is no pre-existing bond. In the sacrament of matrimony, divorce is not allowed by God, even if the state legalizes it. However, if one of the parties contracted a previous marriage, but only civilly and not in the sacrament of matrimony, the party can resort to the Pauline privilege 
for a just cause and still marry another in the church. But there are conditions to check in obtaining a Pauline privilege. What are they? One, if the unbaptized spouse refuses to live with a Catholic spouse or to dwell peacefully in the same house with a Catholic spouse, the baptized spouse may have the marriage dissolved and be free to marry a Catholic partner. This power of the church is based on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 to 15, which clearly explains that if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she consents to live with him, let him not put her away. And if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, let her not put away her husband. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. For a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. 2. Disparity of cult. This is about the Catholic Christian marrying a pagan or a non-Christian without dispensation from the bishop of the canonical form. It invalidates the marriage. Three, sacred orders. Canon 1078, paragraph two and 1087 invalidates a cleric, meaning a deacon, priest, or bishop who was validly ordained in the sacrament of holy orders from contracting marriage. Four, Vow of Chastity, Canon 1078, Paragraph 2 and 1088 explain that a man or a woman who have perpetual vows of chastity and have not yet been officially dispensed by the major superior of the congregation cannot contract marriage. 5. Abduction. Marriage is invalidated if the woman to be married was abducted and forced to marry her abductor against her will. This is stipulated in Canon 1089. 6. Crime. Canon 1090 invalidates the sacrament of marriage if one of the parties murdered his or her spouse to be able to wed his or her future wife or husband. 7. Consanguinity. Canon 1078, paragraph 3, and Canon 1091, paragraphs 1 and 2. Prohibit the marriage if the couple is biologically related to each other by blood in what is called a direct line. This could be a sister, a brother, a mother, a father or grandparent, legitimate or natural. And in the collateral line, fourth degree, first cousin. Eight, affinity. Canon 1092 invalidates the marriage between a blood relative of a deceased husband or wife unless dispensation is granted by the local bishop. No dispensation is granted, however, if the widow is to marry any of the descendants to the direct line of the deceased husband. In the collateral line, the impediment extends to the second degree, first cousin, uncle or aunt, nephew or niece. 9. Public Propriety Canon 1093 explains that this impediment concerns public impropriety arising when a couple lives together after an invalid marriage or a notorious public concubinage. 10. Legal Relationship Canon 1094 invalidates the union or marriage of a man who adopts a woman as his daughter 
and proposes to marry her. The second canonical requirement for the valid matrimony is integral consent. This topic is quite interesting as it explains the conditions that disqualify or allow the validity of consent in marriage. What are these conditions and the canons that disqualify them? First, Canon 1095 on consensual incapacity. There are three sections in this canon that explains consensual incapacity. Paragraph 1. Lack of sufficient use of reasons. This means that at the time of the wedding and during the married life, one of the contracting party or spouse-to-be did not possess the intellectual ability to understand the basic nature of marriage, and to be responsible for his or her actions. Paragraph 2. Grave lack of due discretion. This explains that at the time of the wedding, one of the contracting party or spouse-to-be did not possess the ability to make a mature and prudent decision about whether to marry due to severe cognitive or volitional impairment. Paragraph 3. Inability to assume the essential obligations of marriage. This means that at the time of the wedding and during the married life, due to the severe psychological reasons, one of the contracting party or spouse-to-be was unable to live up to the responsibilities of being a spouse or a parent. Second, Canon 1096, Paragraph 1, on Ignorance. At the time of the wedding, one of the contracting party or spouse-to-be did not know that marriage involved any one of the following. A it is permanent, which means once married, divorce is no longer an option. B. It is a partnership between a man and a woman. C. Marriage is for procreation. D. Indisputably, sexual relationship is part of it. Third, Canon 1097, there are two provisions here. Paragraph 1 speaks of error of person, that is, the physical identity of one of the contracting parties was mistaken. As a result, he or she married the wrong person. Paragraph 2 speaks of error on the quality of the person. Here. A person only wished to marry a spouse that had a certain quality. This quality or characteristics was the primary and the most important consideration for the marriage. But it came to be known that the person's future spouse did not have this quality. For example, a person intended to marry someone who either possessed or did not possess a certain social status, marital status, education, religious conviction, freedom from disease, or arrest 
record. Fourth, Canon 1098, on misconception or imposed error. In order to secure the consent of his or her future spouse, a person maliciously resorts to deception regarding his or her qualities that can seriously disrupt conjugal life. Fifth, Canon 1099 on fraud. Here, a person entered marriage while not accepting that marriage is a faithful union of one man and one woman, a lifelong commitment or a sacrament. His or her belief in this regard were so pervasive and deep-seated that he or she could not and did not marry according to the Catholic Church's understanding of a true marriage. 6. Canon 1101, paragraph 1 and 2, is simulation. This is when the internal consent of the mind does not conform to the words and signs used in the celebration of marriage. For instance, when one or both parties did not really by positive act of will want matrimony, or did not agree with the essential ends of marriage and the essential property of marriage. What are these essential ends or property of marriage that one or both of the contracting parties did not really want to commit to? A. One or both spouses had no intentions to make the commitment for life. B. One or both spouses deny the possibility of procreation, either permanently or for the time. C. One or both spouses did not commit to marital fidelity. D. One or both spouses intend to inflict harm or not provide for the well-being of his or her spouse. E. One or both spouses reject that marriage would be a Christian sacrament. 7. Canon 1102 is about condition. Again, there are two provisions here. Paragraph 1 speaks of a future condition. A spouse enter marriage on condition that a certain circumstance or event would occur, or some expectation would be met in the future. Paragraph 2 speaks of a past or present condition. Here a spouse entered marriage on the condition that some fact was true at the time of the wedding or before. But now it is known that the fact was not actually true. 8. Canon 1103 is about force and fear. This means that in the face of some outside force or pressure, the spouse experienced grave fear which compelled him or her to choose marriage in order to escape the threatened negative consequences. Ninth, Canon 1105, paragraphs 1 to 4 on proxy marriage. When the proxy who represents the real spouse illicitly discharges the mandator's delegation. Now, the third and final canonical requirement for a valid matrimony is canonical form. This is discussed at length in Canons 1095 to 1107. Canonical form means that being a sacrament, 
the marriage must be held before a priest who has the right faculty to solemnize the marriage, that there must be two witnesses, and it is the Roman rite of marriage that will be performed. To explain further, here are the specific requirements to comply with the proper canonical form. First, the proper minister. Based on Canon 1108, paragraph 1, marriage is valid only when contracted in the presence of the proper minister, who can either be the bishop or priests or deacons delegated by either of them in the presence of two witnesses. Second, the ordained official church witness. In Canon 1109, it states that only the local ordinary, meaning the bishop, or the parish priests within the respective jurisdictions, or their delegated priest or deacon can officially and validly assist at marriage. If at least one of the contracting parties is a subject, except when they are suspended, excommunicated, or interdicted, meaning forbidden or banned. Third, the lay official church witness. Canon 1111, paragraphs 1 and 2 explain that in remote areas where there are no priests and deacons, the local bishop can delegate a suitable lay person as church witness in a wedding ceremony when the Holy See has given the Episcopal Conference the approval. Fourth, the common witnesses. Here, Canon 1116, paragraphs 1 and 2 clarify that true marriage can only be validly contracted in the presence of two or more witnesses. Fifth, the extraordinary form. Here, the canonical form of marriage is to be observed, even if only one of the contracting parties is a baptized Catholic who has not formally defected from it. Sixth, binding force. Canon 1121, paragraph 1 clearly explains that marriage is binding as soon as the canonical form of marriage is completed and properly recorded in marriage register of the parish church. Seven, dispensation. Canon 1121, paragraph three, and Canon 1122, paragraphs one and two explain that in the mixed marriage between a Catholic and a Christian spouse, and in disparity of cult marriage between a Catholic and a non-Christian spouse. When there is a dispensation from the canonical form by the local bishop in his jurisdiction, and when the dispensation is granted and marriage is celebrated by the parish priest of the Catholic party, the marriage must be recorded at once in the marriage register of both the parish and the curia of the diocese. Marriage should also be recorded in the baptismal registrar when the Catholic party was baptized. Where do all this explanation about marriage lead us to? It leads us to a fundamental truth. Matrimony is the foundation of the family. When there is openness to love and life, the family becomes a domestic church. It is in the domestic church that parents become 
the first evangelizers of their children to implement the essential ends of marriage, which are procreation and the rearing of children to sanctify them. It is therefore important and mandatory for parents to know the eight basic elements of the Catechism. To fulfill the great mandates of Jesus, that is, to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I have taught you, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19 to 21. A holy family makes a holy church and holy society. If we have holy priests and bishops, it is because we have holy families. But if we have corrupt priests and corrupt government leaders, it is also because we have corrupt families. Article 1655 of the Catechism teaches that Christ chose to be born and grow up in the bosom of the holy family of Joseph and Mary. And the church is nothing other than the family of God. It is in the home, therefore, that the father of the family, the mother and children, and all members of the family exercise the priesthood of the baptized in a privileged way by the reception of the sacraments, prayer and thanksgiving, the witness of a holy life, and self-denial and active charity. That is why Article 1657 of the Catechism concludes that the home is the first school of Christian life and a school for human enrichment. Article 1658 continues to say that the church must be open to all, especially to those who because of circumstance of poverty have no family. No one is without a family in this world. The church is a home and family for everyone, especially those who labor and are heavy burden. Why is it important to know about the sacrament of matrimony? It is important to know well the sacrament as it is the foundation of the family, and because the final battle between God and man is focus on family life. Being the unit cell of the society and the domestic church, if marriage and eventually family life is destroyed, then the society falls apart as well as the church. Every good Christian, therefore, must do everything to defend the sanctity of marriage and family life, even at the expense of supreme sacrifice of offering one's life to protect both. How then should we protect and preserve the sanctity of marriage and family life? In her letter to Cardinal Carlo Capara, the former president, of the Pontifical John Paul II Institute of Studies on Married and Family Life in the 80s, Sister Lucia said that God's victory in the final decisive battle between God and Satan depends on humanity's devotion to her Immaculate Heart. With this message of Our Lady of Fatima giving us the clear solution how to win the final battle let us then make every effort today to consecrate ourselves and our families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and make communion of reparation every first Friday, first Saturday to the Sacred Heart of Jesus conjoined to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. While there is still time, Our Lady of Fatima in 1917 also told the three seers, Francesco, Jacinta, and Lucia, Tell everyone to wear the holy scapular of Mount Carmel, for it is the sign of consecration to my Immaculate Heart. 
Our Lady of Mount Carmel in 1253 likewise promised St. Simon Stock, the Superior General of Carmelite Order, while giving him the scapular as the solution to the difficult times afflicting the church then, saying as he did, This shall be to you and all Carmelites a privilege that anyone who dies clothed in this shall not suffer eternal fire, and if wearing it they die, they shall be saved. Earlier, in 1208, Saint Dominic de Guzman, founder of the Dominican Order, was told by Our Lady, Now one day, to the rosary and the scapular, she shall save the world. Our Blessed Mother repeated this message when she appeared to Sister Lucia in 1957 and said that in the last battle between God and Satan, the last weapon God will use to destroy Satan is the rosary and the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Many years before, on December 10, 1925, Our Lady of Fatima appeared to Sister Lucia while she was recuperating in the Dorothean convent in Tui, Spain, and said the following, Behold my daughter, my heart, encircled with thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. Give me consolation, you at least, and make known on my behalf that I promise to assist at the hour of death with the graces necessary for salvation all who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, one, confess their sins, two, receive Holy Communion, three, recite five decades of the rosary, and four, keep me company with Jesus in the duration of the Blessed Sacrament for at least 15 minutes, meditating on the mysteries of the rosary with a purpose of making reparation to my Immaculate Heart. This climactic message as it is known today, asked for very little in fact. With what we are seeing now, the clear and evident signs of the end times already upon us, marked by the growing apostasy and increase in diabolical activities as Article 675 of the Catechism tells us. We certainly can do more than this that Our Lady asked if repeatedly we had been told the solution how humanity can be on God's winning side when God battles against Satan in his last and decisive confrontation with Satan, could we then let all our efforts be directed and focus solely in accomplishing this? What is at stake is our family and the Catholic Church Nothing is more important than this at this time. Let's begin today and make the commitment if we have not yet started, or if we have, let's then deepen our devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary by committing ourselves for life in doing the following. First, pray the rosary as a family every day. Bring back Catholic family tradition and devotion. Second, consecrate ourselves and every member of our family to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and yes, also to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, by having Jesus and Mary enthroned in our home as its rightful King and Queen. Third, have the brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel imposed on each of our family members during the enthronement 
and to wear it until death. Fourth, join the First Friday, First Saturday Communion of Reparation Vigil in the parish where it is being held nearest you or help open one by getting in touch with us in the Alliance of the Holy Family International. Fifth, make it a way of life to live the core care lifestyle, which is basically a life of consecration, oblation, and reparation, as live in its four important elements, confession, adoration, rosary, and Eucharistic sacrifice of the Mass. This fifth commitment is what all Catholic families must return to if we want to maintain sanctity in marriage and family life, as this core care lifestyle is a sinless and grace-filled way of life that will help anchor the Church and our society to the pillars of salvation in the end times. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.